<laughs> so I will start by saying once again, um, thank you to Blue Sky for making these sessions happen. Um, and to Molly and Zemi, and especially Amanda, whose talents as the uh, best supporting actor in this endeavor will become clear as we get the discussion underway. Um, and I, there maybe are a couple of people who have not been on one of these before. So I'll say, I'm going to talk a very little bit to give us some framing ideas. And then mostly what we're going to do is look at some photographs from um, one of the shows that's currently up at the gallery, um, which unfortunately is not open now, but the show's supposed to stay up uh, all through January. So we're hoping folks will be able to be in to see it in person. Um, and once we start looking at the photographs and also at some poems that I've paired with the photographs, then it really becomes a conversation. And I'll ask um, a few provocative questions, but it will mo mostly be on you guys. And we have found that using both the chat for people who like to type their comments and then also the raise hand feature, not the physically raising a hand, because once I start sharing screens, we can't see everybody's faces anymore or their little raised hands. But there is, um, if you haven't Zoomed a lot yet, and I don't know where you've managed to be if you haven't, uh, on, a, on, on a laptop or desktop device, you go down to the bottom of your screen and click on participants and there's a raise hand feature. And I'm not quite sure how to get to it on a tablet. But if you're struggling, put your struggles in the chat when we get to that point and somebody else will be helpful because that's the sort of people we are here. Um, so in real life, I do these programs in the gallery also with the work that's on the walls and often pairing it with poetry. And I do that because I'm really interested in uh, the way we can build community by talking about art and literature um, and that we're building our understanding together. So if, if this evening ended with me not thinking differently about the photographs and the poems that I've already been obsessing about because I was choosing them as the ones we would talk about, I would be surprised and disappointed because you all are gonna make me see things in them that I didn't see on my own and we will help each other to see things. So really that's the point is just not to get at any kind of right answer, but to build community and connection. As it happens, the work that we're gonna be talking about is from the exhibit Women of the African Diaspora. And so there are three photographers in that exhibit. I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them tonight, but the beauty of an exhibit that goes into January is that we may get a chance to do this again with the, the same photographs or the same photographers, not the same photographs. And I was thinking about this, like the programs about building community and diaspora, which is a term that's really familiar to me because I am from a diasporic people, though not people of the African diaspora, but diaspora is about people and this culture that is dispersed from its place of origin. And the African diaspora is both centuries long and as recent as the newest immigrants who are even at this moment maybe preparing to depart for school, for work, for love, for survival from the places they have known to places as yet unknown. The African diaspora was of course initially and uh, largely a forced diaspora, the kidnapping um, of Africans for both the internal and the international slave trade, but it has now continued into migrations that are across the Caribbean, throughout the Americas, more broadly, into Europe, into Asia, into every place on the planet. So it's interesting to think about community on the one hand, which is what we're doing here, and diaspora, this sense of connection and the sense of being dispersed. And I just wanted to like raise up those concepts before we started talking. And last month, uh, I framed the discussion by reading two minutes of hoity-toity art history, which I lifted from the website of the Tate Gallery. And I'm actually going to read that same part of that same section again, because uh, to contrast, the last time we were talking about um, what would have been, if, if they had been paintings, genre, uh, genre paintings, which are sort of the, um, the idea of the scenes of everyday life. But today we're talking about portraits and the work that's up in this exhibition is not just portraits, but I happen to have uh, narrowed our focus for tonight on portraits. But so here's the hoity-toity art history part. Are you ready? In the hierarchy of subject types for art established in the 17th century by the French Academy, the ranked order was history painting, portrait painting, landscape painting, genre painting, the scenes of everyday life and still life. 
These were seen by the art establishment as having varying levels of importance, with history painting, the painting of scenes from history, the Bible, or literature, as the most important genre, and still life, paintings of still objects, as the least important. So first of all, we've moved up in the world. We used to be like one from the bottom at last month, and now we're one from the top. Um, but I'm sort of curious about why did the hoity-toity of the French Academy in the 17th century regard, regard portraiture so highly? So maybe that's a question we could start with before we even look at photographs. What, why, why is portraiture considered an important, a more important than others uh, type of, in their case, painting? Oh, Eugenia's saying royalty, right? So maybe whose portraits are being painted? Uh, other thoughts? Molly Newgard, who's raising her physical hand, even though I told her to wear his her. I know, hand. I couldn't remember for a second how to raise my hand, but now I remember. Um, well, I think it's kind of in this immortalization of, of self um, or of um, family, of lineage for posterity. Um, that's why people had their, you know, their portraits painted. Um, so it is a way to capture that likeness and have it exist for eternity. Yeah, so one is the, the purpose of portraiture and also the access to portraiture. So Eugenia started us off with royalty and Molly Major said, yes, an indication of class. It wasn't everybody whose portraits were being painted necessarily. It was those who could afford the commission of the artist. So thinking about this Western tradition, as we are told by the French Academy and the Tate Gallery versus an diasporic African tradition, uh, as we think about the portraits that we're gonna look at today, are these simply an extension of that tradition or are they doing something else entirely? Um, and that's, that's sort of a meta question, but I'll ask some more specific questions as we go. But anytime you feel like, Lois, you have not returned us to that meta question and I have something to say about it, feel free to jump in and say, oh, I'm thinking about this in terms of, of the lineage and portraiture question. Um, but maybe we should just jump in and take a look at some photographs. What do you think? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. It's gonna take a moment for everything to look groovy, but fear not, it will happen. One, that one, come over here. I think if I do that. Okay, I snuck in this picture. This is this is actually from the other uh, exhibition that's currently up in the gallery, Glenna Jennings. And we looked at this image and discussed it last month. But when I was going to reuse my slide deck to make the slides for tonight, I looked at this one and I thought, oh, this is really interesting because when we talked about this list last time, I wasn't thinking about the African diaspora. And when I think about the African diaspora and I look at this picture, I think about how this woman's head wrap and even the way that she's wearing her jewelry seems to come out of an African diasporic sense of how you display yourself in the world. So I was like, oh, this is very exciting to make that connection. And also to think about how much is going on in this photograph as opposed to the photograph that we're actually about to talk about. So look at everything in the scene. And we talked about so many elements of things in the background and the foreground and bodies and all of these things last time. But instead, this time, we're gonna talk about this picture to start. So take a few moments, and I'm gonna be a little more directive than I sometimes am. Um, look at this really hard and just try to memorize every detail of it that you can. All right, now I'm going to cruelly take it away. What emotional effect did that photograph have on you? And obviously whatever your answer is, is the right answer because it's about the emotional effect that it had on you. Um, 
But I thought maybe we could start with that question. And again, feel free to use the chat or if we're all on one screen now, you could probably raise the physical hand or the mechanical hand. Chuck is ready to start us off. Oh, good. Chuck Barnes, please. All right. Uh, well, I think the sense of wondering who the person is on the other side, like this sort of intense sense of curiosity of there's a person looking out at me and I'm looking back and the wish for them to be revealed. So curiosity, a desire for exposure, but also a sense that they were looking at you, mm -hmm. not just that you were looking at them. How about then Molly Major and then Chris Rauschenberg? Um, it seemed to be doors to a closet instead of shutters to a window. So I was thinking either she's hiding and she had a little worry, um, frown, you know, like a crease in her brow. So it seemed like she might be a, a little bit afraid of something. Um, and yeah, I was more curious about her feelings than I was about my own feelings. I was going to point that out. I was going to try and put you on the spot and say, you're doing a good job of, of describing the photograph, which is one of the things that I also want us to do. But I wanted to push you about how it made you feel. But really, you just wanted to know more about the person. Well, I think I, because I notice, because of what I, I think I noticed, I, I became sort of worried about her in some way. Because of her feeling like she's hidden and enclosed in some way. Uh, oh, and Chris was next, I think. Chris, you have to unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, we did a Blue Sky book for this show. And, uh, and that's, this is originally the picture that I put on the cover. And then the curator said, oh, actually, I'd how about this picture on the cover, <laughs> um, which is the, you, most of you haven't seen it yet, but it's the back of somebody's head with beads in their hair. But I put this on the cover because I felt like the picture made a very strong connection with the viewer, as in this case, me, <laughs> of, uh, of connection across a, some kind of a chasm, across some kind of a, a barrier. And I thought that was really an interesting way to, to announce the book on the cover. And, and also just as a graphic design principle, anytime you're making eye connection with something, it stops you, you know. If, you, if you're walking by, you know, a line of books of pals and one of them is, the book is looking back at you, <laughs> you, you interact with it um, yeah. or, the, or a poster or whatever. Yeah, it's a really compelling photograph. And I think that idea of um, it's, you, you said, you know, there's a connection across a barrier. There's this literal barrier about whether they're doors, shutters, we can't quite tell, um, but also the barrier of, for us, difference, um, but maybe also the barrier of knowing and not knowing, coming back to what Chuck said was curiosity and what Molly said was even for her accelerates to concern. Um, why don't I bring the picture back? All right. Uh, what are some of the, besides the figure, what else or what about the figure is so striking? Tell me, tell me more about what you notice in this picture. Or are there things now that I've brought it back that you didn't necessarily remember exactly as they are? And at this point, I can't see everybody anymore. So you'll have to use the raise hand feature or the chat, please. Um, and it looks like Rebecca, I can only call you by the name that um, that Zoom has put on your profile now. Uh, Rebecca says, are the doors opening or closing? I wonder, yeah, that we don't, um, we don't, it, that there's some implied narrative here that we just don't have any real way of knowing. And I think Anne Candelin and then Molly Newgard would be up next. 
what an interesting thing to me is that it feels like as the viewer, I am being judged. Where usually we are the one putting into what we see and interpreting it. Um, the way the gaze is looking out makes me feel very much um, that I am being questioned or judged, which is, I think, really interesting. Can you say what in particular about the gaze is doing that? I don't disagree with you. I'm just trying to kind of get, get my head around it. I think it's both, um, I mean, the, the eye, of course, is just beautiful and striking, but it's also even the, the way the mouth is curved. Um, it, it just gives me that impression and feeling. Yeah, and that eye is so dead center in the photograph, which of course, on a full on facial portrait wouldn't be the case, right? The fact that there's only one eye and it really occupies central space as um, highlighted by both color in here, but also the, um, the way that the lines of the shuttered wood I don't know. I don't know what the right word is for the way that the the slats. I guess the lines of the slats are also all pointing in. Um, and was Molly Newgard next? Um, sure. Actually, to 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 build on what Anne said, I I I feel that way too. You know, we think about photography as. Um, you know, it's kind of a voyeur, it's a voyeuristic ac activity. We are, we as the viewer are looking at the photographs. And I really feel as, as Anne feels too, is that, that I'm being observed as the viewer um, in the power of this image as, as the, um, you know, as the figure looks at, looks out. And because again, we are mostly seeing the eye, um, I feel like eyes are, eyes are on me. And so it's a little bit, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but at the same time, also to speak to what Rebecca said about opening and closing, like I do wonder if are the shutters, are they opening to take a peek at who's outside or, or closing the viewer out? So it's, it's really a lot of tension that's very, very interesting in this work. Molly Major is up next. Yeah, I, I like what Anne said too. And I, I think um, I definitely, I wouldn't say judged, I would say evaluate. Like she's evaluating. Mm. Um, What's the difference for you in the connotation between those terms? Um, that she has a choice. I mean, I, I think of her as opening the door. I think of evaluating as um, evaluating danger, perhaps. Um, you know, as a woman, I think we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Do we walk into this parking garage? Do we, you know, how open are we on the street? You know, I have that feeling with her too. She, the, and because the door is only partially open, that, um, that it is even more, will suggest even more sort of care with how much she reveals of herself while she evaluates whoever is looking at her. Yeah, and that she is choosing to peer out with one eye and not both, right? So like I'm a little bit more protected than if I was peering out even just the difference between this and this. Um, and some of the, there's been this debate in the chat about whether the, the doors are opening, <laughs> whether she's retreating, um, whether this idea of maybe she's actually deciding whether she's letting us in, right? That we we've, have mostly been talking as a we occupy the main space and she's cut off and is either retreating from or entering into the space that we're in. But maybe it's also about whether we're being let in. Um, who knows what's on the other side that we're, but held out from at this point. Uh, other things that are striking you about this photograph? Uh, Chris Rauschenberg, I think would like to go next. Yeah, well, uh, this is something that I responded to, but I didn't think to myself in words, but one of the reasons the picture is so striking when, when you were saying, yes, it's only one eye, it, the way that the, the uh, where her face is cropped by the two doors, it makes it abstracted like Picasso or something. I mean, it's like, it's this, the nose is kind of seeming to come in from another angle and the half mount. I mean, 
it becomes a very abstracted face that's very beautiful, I think. And, uh, and so there's this other layer to it that uh, that's sort of separate from the human interaction. There's a, there's just a, it's just a, you know, a great abstract composition uh, and abstraction of the world. And that it's really hard to read the emotion of those features, right? If the, if the mouth were curved up a little more, we could read her as happy. If it were curved down a little more, we could read her as sad or angry. But um, it's a, and, and possibly if we could see the rest of her face even with, and I'm assuming it's a she, which is really funny because actually I was looking at this photograph with somebody the other day who, was, who referred to this person as he. Um, the uh, no, actually, I I want to say she because of I know the title of the piece is Marisa, but the um, but that maybe if we saw the rest of the face, we would be able to read the emotion more. But it, as you said, it it sort of makes it abstract because it's not it's not doing one of the things that we expect faces to do, which is to tell us something about what's being expressed with that face. Yeah, the eyes, nose, and mouth are are almost separate elements that are not that are not part of a package. They're they're just their own things. And I think again that part of the reason we have that feeling is because the um, the eye is so centered in the photograph, and the um, and there's a slight tilt. I don't know if there is actually a slight tilt to the head, or if it just looks like there is because there's the tilt of these shutters or doors against. Uh, through which we see the head, but it does sort of, they, the eyes, nose, and mouth, as you say, don't relate to each other as, um, as we expect them to. And- uh, well, I think I saw Evan Schneider raise his hand on the screen and then maybe Gerilyn wants to also chime in. Great, thank you. I guess the first thing that uh, <clears throat> struck me about it was the white doors and this person looking out, is the white world keeping her in or out? Or is there some sort of, uh, it's a really strong dynamic to me when I see this image of somebody being kept from coming in or somebody very apprehensive about trusting and going in. Yeah, it's hard not to read the whiteness of the white shutters as metaphorical as well as literal. Um, and it's also interesting to think about the way, the work that color is doing in this photograph. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask somebody to tell us something about the blueness of the shirt because I feel like it's doing something and I'm not quite sure what, but I think we're, Gerilyn was gonna uh, unmute next, please. Yeah, I just, it was interesting listening that people felt like she was in a closet or being kept behind because to me it's just like someone in a house that's looking out to see what the commotion is like what, what's going on out there um and not in such a negative sense but i i don't know um listening it's it's interesting to listen to how everybody interprets an image differently like where where our mind is and what our thought process is and maybe because i'm not fully focused i apologize i'm working <laughs> But um, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know, to me, it's just, I feel like she's like, oh, what's going on out there? Right, we talked about our curiosity, but you're saying, well, you're reading her as curious, which totally makes sense too, as a, as a reading of this photograph. Yeah, I mean, it's, she's got a little up tilt in her lip. So it, to me, yeah. it's sort of like, huh, like what is that going on out there? Um, Eugenia said, I think about the, when we were talking about the uh, shutters or doors, she used the word whitewashed. And that's really interesting too, because just thinking about you know, a teeny bit about the, uh, some of the ways in which white functions in architectural history, that we tend to associate it with, um, with something that's more clean or hygienic or pure, although that's not necessarily what it would mean in every culture. But thinking about how our readings of, of whitewashed uh, buildings or parts of buildings also come in there. Did anybody want to say something about that, the blueness? Evan, do you, do you want to jump in? 
Yeah, I'll just uh, say when I first saw it, I thought it was a school girl because in, in Africa, a lot of the school uniforms are either a light green or a blue. And so it looked like uh, a student to me when I just first saw, first saw the image. Definitely reads as young. And I'm trying to think about why I feel like I know anything about this person's age because we can't see, you know, all, any place that might show where my wrinkles are on my face or things like that. But, um, and Yu Yang put something in the chat about the elements of color. Um, would, Yu Yang, would you unmute and tell us more about what you were thinking? Oh yeah, um, so initially I was just thinking about like um, um, image wise, um, Conversational wise, um, this girl um, with her darker skin tone and uh, this kind of cyan ish blue color, and this like sharp contrast between be between the girl and uh, everything else the, 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 the door, the white doors, and um, the really dark shadows. I'm just like, like, um, phot photography wise, I'm just thinking about this like really interesting contrast. Uh, both like a literal contrast and then maybe a metaphorical contrast between between a human, between a colorful human and then um, a um, colorless uh, objects. Yeah, for sure. And it there's the way that color is functioning and also, as you were saying, light and shadow, right? This is like hyper lit in parts of this photograph and yet a really deep shadow also. And just thinking about how different it would look. What would we feel differently? How would we feel differently about this picture? How would it affect us differently if there was none of the shadow on the person who's at the center of the photograph? Or if the lighting wasn't so um, striking that the white is as bright as it is, right? That, there, that that's a technical element that seems easy to see the effect of, but so important in terms of the way it shapes the photograph. Yeah, I also want to add up to um, the, the lighting and the use of the flash, I suppose. Uh, just uh, can help thinking about like using a light, especially in this image. Um, uh, kind um, the, the, the use of lights connects um, Create the narr narrative um, between the photographer and uh, and this girl, uh, because I think the light is kind of to me it's kind of a the 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 act of taking a photograph um, has always been uh, intrusive to me. It's an action of very intrusive action when you especially when you take a photo. Let's say you're on the street, you take a photo of someone in the store in in the storefront. You will sometimes you will see that um, reaction to the from the subject you are taking off. Like they may look around, look back at you. Uh, as someone in the chat has already said, that, that they're they're not they're not like um, afraid of you or something. They're probably just like judging what's going on. And then then we have this face on this girl, which is very neutral. Like you have you. You can you cannot really tell what kind of a what 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 is the exact emotion um, she has, and this is like a pure. I think it's like a very to me it's a very evaluational phase to me, and then this uh, the, the 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 use of the lights actually um, kind of creates that narrative, and and yeah, and and to this. <laughs> and as you were talking, I was thinking about the. Um... The fact that we've, we've been talking about her having a relationship with the viewer or us as viewers having a relationship with her, but of course, we're not really the ones who are standing there, but the photographer is, right? And that the um, clearly there is, as you're saying, this, there's some narrative there too about the photographer's relationship to the subject, the subject's relationship to the pho photographer, which is true in any photograph, but we can guess proximity, physical proximity here is pretty close and pretty tight. And yet the sense of who the photographer is or even evaluating the subject's emotion in terms of the photographer, like we all were talking about it in terms of ourselves, which is a really an interesting, an 
interesting way to think about, last time we also talked about, there were one of the other photographs where we were discussing of Jenna's, I was saying, look, it's an all, it feels like it's an all male space here, you know, and Chris was like, well, actually no, because the photographer is a woman and she's sitting at that table too, right? So where does the photographer disappear? Or how does the photographer disappear into the photo? Other things you wanna say about this? Yeah, Amanda, we're, were you gonna? The next one, I think Rebecca would like to say something. Yeah. Um, this goes back to your question about the blue in mm -hmm. the shirt. And, you know, after spending some time with this, um, the first, I was very drawn in to her face and her expressions. But then when I start to look a little deeper into the shadow, I think that that blue and the shadow that is off the shutter Mm -hmm. is so fascinating because it almost creates a cup and it's it's very um it's a, it's very much of a geometric image that uh makes her face almost disembodied from the rest of her at that point and then above on the top of her head it's the the gradual you see the three dimensions as it kind of fades to the back um, but I think that that shadow and that shirt is just a really fascinating component in this photograph. I, mean, I think this, when I decided to start with this photograph, uh, and this is also the one that, that I said to Molly, I'll put this in the program announcement. Part of it is because I think that her strong, the strong gaze connection, as Chris said, is always powerful and it's especially powerful in this photograph. But also that this is such a deceptively simple photograph, right? If you think back to the, um, no, wait. how much is going on in any of Jenna's photographs versus it seems like there's almost nothing in this photograph, but there's so much in this photograph. We've spent a lot of time talking about it um, and there's probably more we could do if we wanted to, but it's kind of, it's, I don't know, it's just fascinating to me for that. Um, Amanda, is anybody else waiting? No, I think we're ready to move on to the next picture. Okay, well, actually we're gonna look at a poem next. Um, and this is a super short poem. Um, it's by a poet named Kwame Dawes, who was born in Ghana, grew up in Kingston, Jamaica, attended the University of New Brunswick, which for those of you who are not familiar with your geography is in Atlantic Canada. And then he taught at the University of South Carolina and now teaches at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And I thought, well, you don't get much more diasporic than that in one, and he's, he's not even ancient, uh, in one not so old person's life. Um, and we're gonna look at this poem differently than we usually look at poems in these sessions, um, stanza by stanza. And as you look at each stanza, stop and think about what emotional effect that stanza has, what you're anticipating will come next. And then when you see the next stanza, what's the effect of having your expectation either met or not met as you see the stanza, the next stanza. So let's do that. So this is the first stanza. What's the effect it's having on you? What are you anticipating? And keep those thoughts in your head because we'll go through the whole poem before we start talking about it. Next stanza. So how did this one meet or not meet your expectations? What was the effect of that? And now what are you anticipating might come next? Here again, what expectations are met or not met? What's the effect of having this stanza revealed and what might you think is coming next or want to have come next. So 
So I'm interested in hearing how things were unfolding for you as the stanzas of the poem were revealed. Who wants to jump in? Here from Molly Newbird. Um, so what struck me immediately was the the act of seeing um, someone seeing someone or observing someone seeing something else or seeing something in back in that person. So it was like this. I don't know, sort of like this maze, like where, where, where is this act of seeing going? Um, and that's, the, the, the last stanza too was, I don't know, it was almost ex expected. It wasn't unexpected, mm -hmm. um, but gave, gave the kind of the emotional punch in the end. And of course, this is a difference between poetry and photography is that with photography, the photographer and the photograph can't control where my eyes go when. Everything's there and I might, I might look at the, in the last photograph at her eyes first and only later notice the shirt. I may start thinking about the way that the shutters are coming in from the edges into the middle and then look at the figure. The photograph can't control that. The poem controls the order in which the images or the ideas come to us. That's, that's the nature of the written word. It's directive in a different way. But I also like, as you see, I'm heavy handed in my, um, my interest in looking uh, for this session. And I actually purposely didn't want to read this one out loud because I didn't want to decide how to pronounce the title of this poem. I, you can read the title of this poem as seer, which means really somebody who has a, a particular gift of sight, um, like a prophet, or as seer, which is just anybody who sees. I don't know if I did a strong enough differentiation in my articulation of those words. Um, but as Molly said, this is, this is about the subject of the poem, looking at the speaker of the poem, look and see both occur as verbs in this poem, but also we know that the speaker of the poem has to be looking at the person that they're addressing or else they don't know what that person is seeing. So there's, again, this back and forth of looking going on. Um, and Amanda, I don't know if anybody has their hands up. Yeah, a couple of people, Molly Majors next and then Chuck is after that. Great, thank you. So I did something really stupid and didn't look at the title, which would have given me a clue. But um, last night you look, and I had it directed outwards, not towards someone or me, um, and then at me hard and then soft was like, oh. And I started getting sort of protective with the next one, like you see something. And I, I don't like, oh no, <laughs> I don't want you to see anything, you know, kind of thing. And then old and sad in me, I was like, damn. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting too that like that pairing of old and sad, right? It, it this would be a completely different poem if it said old and wise in me, right? Maybe also a completely different poem if it said young and sad in me, that there's some combination of those two especially with the last night looking and looking. I guess I want to read relationship news in, in that. Um, did you say that Chuck Barnes is next? Yes. Yeah, there's these interesting things in time that, that happen too. So it's last night you look rather than you looked. And then like you see something. And then the, the notion of seer versus seer, like the seer, like being a prophet, 
if you see something old, like it's, it, you, you can, you, one way you can read that is you're looking at the future of, of this person, right? Like, so that, that seer is, is the, is, there seems to be, uh, there's not clarity about the time through the whole, through the whole poem. Yeah, and I think um, the strict grammarian in me, at first I was like, did I, did I copy this poem incorrectly? Is, could, this, could it really have not said you looked? And of course, when you get to the like you see, that agrees in verb tense with look. And then I went back to that first line. My initial reading, and it sounds like the initial reading that um, many of you are, are voicing is that this is about what happened last night, right? Last night, and then we wanted to say you looked, but there's another way to read that, which is this is the last night, right? Uh, we might strict grammarians put in a colon. Last night, colon, this is what's going on in the last night. Um, last night, you look at me. So it's the last night of something. How does that, does that change the poem for you? What was the question there? I'm sorry. <laughs> that that we, we don't have to, last night could mean something that happened not on this day, but on the previous night, but it could also mean this is the last night of something, right? Um, last night of vacation, pressure's on to have a good time because tomorrow it's back to the drudgery of work, right? Um, last night before I leave to go to Michigan for the first time in months, is that uh, where somebody's going? Um, that, that this could be something that is happening on the last night of something. And that's why it's in the present tense. It's not referring to something that happened yesterday, but that is happening in this moment that is the last night of something that has continued up until this night and will continue no longer. I feel like I'm doing sentence diagramming. Amanda, what's up? Mr. Ashenberg, what's up? Yeah, well, I mean, I. It's funny because when you just showed us last night, you look, I thought it was going to be, you look lovely or something, you know, that it, that it was going to be, the looking was going to be in the other direction. Yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then, you know, you looked at me hard and then soft. I, I was interpreting that as, you know, you were, you're giving me the hairy eyeball and then you decided I was okay. But as it goes along and, and also to echo your, your, um, second grammatical hypothesis that maybe this is the last night of something. Um, I think that what that there's a particular part of him that was maybe hard and then soft, if I can be delicate. <laughs> that I think it's about, in that sense, when I look at the whole poem, I think it's about the end of a romantic relationship, sexual relationship. Right, and so that's a physical description which is also interesting again, because we tend to think, I'm thinking of the, um, the there's a series of uh, photographs by Carrie Mae Weems of her and Robert Colescott that some of you may know uh, with her in his studio. So it's a photograph, it's her photograph, it's her work of art, but it is as though he is painting her in the studio. And I'm forgetting that because it's Carrie Mae Weems, there's text that goes with the photos. And she talks about reenacting that old paradigm of you know, artist and subject. Uh, so we expect, last night you look, last night I'm looking at you, I'm telling you how you appear. Oh no, what you're looking at me. And then the complication of this idea of lovers, the end of a romance or the end of something. And again, we don't quite know what, but we want to know more. Other thoughts on this? Yeah, Rebecca, would you like to chime in now? Um, yeah, so I, kind of on the last night concept, but 
And it goes to not what I felt when I read each of the stanzas, but when I read the whole thing and then went back and looked at it again. But I see, I read it as something very forgiving and very loving in the way because it said last night, you look at me hard and then soft. And I think the soft is perhaps re re represents um, a, a way of looking that is not as judgmental. And then it says, you see something old and sad in me. So when it shifts that you looked at me hard and soft, I think there's an acceptance there of how she may or he or whoever um, perhaps feels old and sad in me and has that part in themselves and that the person that's looking has sees that but then softens their their glance anyway. Um, yeah, I mean that we can read this either as as some kind of dismissal or as exactly the opposite as Re Rebecca is positing that it's actually a tenderness. Um Molly Major Molly Major, did you still want to say something? And then if not No, I just totally agree <laughs> with Rebecca. Um that's was exactly what I was thinking, so I took my hand down. Cool. Okay, how about then Molly Newgard? Um, yeah, emotionally, I would, I would tend to agree too. I feel as we are talking through this more and I'm reading it again and again, emotionally, I'm feeling senses, sense of forgiveness and, and regret. So it's the end, something has come to an end. Um, but there is, there is a softness to that. There is a forgiveness. Um, and again, this notion of this notion of regret, perhaps as in the last stanza. I'm kind of loving the, um, it's beyond ambiguity that we're finding here. We're finding some really very distinct and different possibilities of ways to read this poem. And that of course is part of what I find so compelling about the poetry as well as the photography that, um, that the more time we spend with it, the more we find in it. And that as with the first photograph, well, as with the photograph we were just discussing, which is so seems to have um, to be so spare in what's represented, and yet there's so much to talk about. I mean, how many words is this? Two, four, seven, nine, twelve, thirteen, sixteen, maybe eighteen word poem, and yet here we are. Nineteen, if we throw in the uh, deliberately ambiguous title, um, but so much to find in it. Um, Anybody else want to say more about this one? Uh, no one's got their hand raised at the moment. Okay, then maybe it's time to look at another photograph. And I won't be as uh, direct as necessarily. So just take a few minutes and look at it and think about what, what you notice, whether you have questions about it for the rest of us to try to answer. Who's ready to start us off? Looks like Chuck Barnes. So I'm not sure whether there's sort of ambiguity about inside and outside, because it looks like you know they're in a garden, but yet there are sort of walls, which maybe are screens. But there's also this very interesting, if you look at the edges of the boundary of the edges that she's in it, it it appears like it's a pool so is she 
the she, I'm assuming it's a she, I don't know, uh, are walking on water? Like what, what, what exactly is, is going on? Uh, Turns out we, we started with a narrow little strip of a photograph of a, or of a figure and couldn't tell what was going on. But here's this figure seemingly, yes, out in the open and we still can't figure out what the hell is going on. <laughs> Amanda, who, were you gonna tell me somebody else is waiting? Yeah, Chris is next. Yeah, I mean, I, she's definitely walking on water. And, and I mean, the, my first look at this, it was like, oh, well, you know, I'm looking at this person, but they're taking a flash picture. They're looking at something else. I'm, and I can't see them because they're looking. They're sort of uh, taking over the line, if, that, if I can put it that way. But then, then when I notice what, what Chuck was talking about too, it's like, oh, well, but wait a minute, is this person, um, who has ritually appeared <laughs> uh, or, or whatever. Is this, is this somebody godlike? Um, walking mm. on water is normally uh, reserved for, for the gods. Um, and, uh, and is this uh, not just a, a flash from an instamatic camera, but is this, you know, the eye of God or something like that? Ooh, oh, I'm loving this. I hadn't even, I hadn't thought about that. Of course, who, who walks on water, of course. And the fact that the title of the piece directs us to think about ceremony and ritual. Yu Yang is next. Um, so I'm really interested if this photo is a um, result of a uh, coordinated act because um, Judging by the um, light source of the um, the flash, I can assume the photographer might be in like behind the glass or something, um, be, uh, and and then and then this 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 person, assuming she's a woman, um, she also she's also using a flash on her phone. Just looking, just judging by the photo, it's look because it looks like. There's a one flash coming from the top of the phone, and then there's another flash coming from the corner, the 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 the, the, the like this, this this corner of the phone. So it looks like this the the two the, they're, they're both taking photos. They're both taking photos, uh, taking photos with flash at the same time, which um which is really interesting to me because um and because of that, I was. I was keep wondering first there's like interior and uh, exterior thing like whether whether this photographer is in, uh, behind a glass or something and then um, this is like uh, obscure like because of the flash I couldn't really uh, figure out the, the the facial figures of that of that uh, woman um, in, in in robe so yeah I just found that the the the, the 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 yeah the fact that the fact that they're using flash uh, are very interesting. And I'm um, just wondering if this is also a, uh, a coming back to that, it's like a coordinated act. And was, if it's a coordinated act, was the intention that I wanna take your photograph it, I mean, it's so weird to have the subject of a photograph both be obscured and also radiating light. Like, doesn't it seem like it should be one or the other? Are you obscured or are you the source of illumination? But obscured and illumination are actually the same, the same in this photograph. Uh, Chris Rauschenberg is next. Well, I'm assuming that uh, that Woodlene is using a slave to light the uh, thing, and that the that the subject in the in the robe is actually triggering the the flash that it's that her flash is the main flash that's triggering Woodlene's uh, oh. slave, uh, because I mean a flash is a thousandth of a second. You're you're not gonna you're not gonna get that to line up. You could do a long exposure. Um, but it look the scene looks like it's lit by flash. So, so for those those who are not photographers in the crowd, what you're saying is that there is a way mechanically for Woodleen to have set this up so that the flash, the the phone flash triggers another flash. 
Yeah, in in people who do um, fancy lighting <laughs> in commercial photography and stuff, you you want to do thing with a flash, but you want if you're going to have four lights, you and it's a flash, they got to all go at the same time. So they're normally you set it up so that so that uh, three of them are slaves that are that are being triggered by the by the sort of master flash. Yes, and Eugenia is expressing in the chat as somebody who spends all of her time in the 19th century, that's where I usually spend my time. The the fact that slave is the word that is used there is like, oh, that's really interesting. Like nobody says teammate, right? <laughs> that there's um, such a strange hierarchy about labor and history just built into that terminology. Yeah. Well, it, in teammates, you you could each have a say about what's going on. If 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 one flash just tells all the others what to do and they just have to do it no matter what they want to do, that's not really team. No, you're right. But I, I don't know. I want to find some other synonyms: actor, reactor, as opposed to um, other. I'm going to pipe in real quick because there's all kinds of discussion going on about the using the word slave for the flash in photography right now. Really? There's, there's like group discussions all over the internet about this. It's really, it's really interesting because it's just how we've always used the terminology. And, but then like, why is it that we're using this terminology and what a horrible term to use for this? Um, so I, yeah. I take it these conversations uh, are part of the fact that somehow uh, much of America that wasn't noticing race or the history of racism until 2020 has suddenly started noticing Absolutely. race Absolutely. That's really interesting. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I'll try to find a couple of the group discussions. One of them's on Flack Photo. I know that one's been going on for a long time, but there's a couple of them out there. Let me see if I can find them. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca is next. I'm just so chatty tonight. Um, but when I look at this, if you, uh, depending on how you read this image and after you sit with it a while, it's almost like the eye and the perspective is almost like the eye in the first image. And that if that is a flash and you assume there was a camera underneath it and not just holding a flash, that, that's, that it's actually you that are being observed here instead of the other way around. Um, but I think just design wise, I think there's something very similar um, between having the eye, the center of the last image and in the open spaces you have um, this light flashing towards you in this, this one. And um, I, I like Chris's thought, you know, of having it be godlike, but it also, I. Um, just being in the photography world, I also have a sense that um, a flash just went off and my my photo just got taken, you know, that it's kind of a, a two-way street in, in this particular image. Yeah, that the, um, who's, who's gazing at whom in the other photograph that we talked about is then who's capturing whom with their with their flash and thus their photograph in this image and you're right you totally nailed uh, caught me out that i was there it's not an accident that i chose to put this picture following right after the other one because to me i'm reading it similarly to you where the the light here seems to to be doing very similar work to what the eye was doing in the other photograph and even the fact that Although this person, we can see their whole body, they're sideways to us. So that presumably if that image wasn't there, their head isn't turned to the camera. So we would probably still only be seeing one eye if the eye were there for us to see. Um, Eugenia also wants us to pay attention to the way that the title of the piece, right? And that, um, Woodland is, uh, she lives in the US now, but she's originally, was, she was born in Haiti. So this is um, Creole Ceremony Disparition, Ritual Disappearance, although the, I don't, I don't know if the dis is just added in the English translation or with if 
appearance and disappearance would both be implied in disparition. Um, but Eugenia, what do you want us to think about that title? or notice, or what are your questions about it? Well, I mean, I guess, because since I use writing and words as well in my work, in work in general, I got, I look at them, I think of them, and they, I think, I hate titling things like art, you know, but, but it's interesting that there's appearance and disappearance, because she's there, but then, of course, she's obscured, so all the things you're talking about, but the fact that she put it in the title is interesting. I'm just saying it's interesting, like, when an artist does something, you look at the entire package, including and I appreciate the words. I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just saying, I said, look at the title, you guys. There's something to it. <laughs> but um, yeah, th I don't know. That's all I we just noticed it. I just love this. I want to say that I appreciate. Um, I do. I try to, to do my stuff in the chat because I've had some issues here locally. I don't, I just appreciate the whole um, thing of the community and the fact that there's a lot of discussion and that we can just chime in and stuff is very, I appreciate it. Anyway, nice. That's all. But I think that's just, do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe yeah. photographers don't always do that, but I think it's interesting that she emphasized that in the title as well. Yeah, I mean, some photographers definitely use their titles more than others. So Jenna's work is all like completely, they're just numbers, right? They're, there's not, I think she tells us where the pictures were taken and just numbers. This is clearly much more informational. Um, can we talk a little bit about textures in this photograph? Because I feel so much texture in this photograph. Um, that the plushness of that robe, maybe um, whatever the hell is going on with this, are we walking on water? Is there some cover? Is that a pool? What is that? But that um, maybe in particular because we see bare feet on it. Like, I want to know what that surface feels like. It seems um, clearly not smooth, that there is even the, um, I want to say ferns, but that will only reveal that I have absolutely no idea about plants or horticulture, but the plants in the background seem very textured. The, there's a texture to them that I want to pay attention to. I can't quite tell, like, are those metal posts that we're seeing? Like, I just feel like there's a lot of tactile stuff going on here. Am I, am I the only one who's noticing this? What is it? What do you guys think about it? The tactile nature of the elements. McQuarrens is going to go first, but first I'll um, weigh in about the pool cover because I was a lifeguard in high school and those are usually like blue and they have the texture and look and feel of a bunch of bubble wrap layered together. So you are, are you then drawing on your previous work experience confirming that this is indeed a pool with a pretty standard pool cover on it? That is correct. That is, it definitely looks like a pool to me. And my guess is would be that she's standing on the railing coming down to the stairs. Oh. Oh. I'm not quite seeing it, not but really I'm going to- the illusion it. of she's definitely walking on water. Yeah. Um, Chuck Barnes, what were you going to tell us? I was going to say a couple things about the feel of things. It looks like the those leaves look like they want to sort of, they're reaching out for the figure God goddess person, right? There's this, there's this, uh, the, they're at the same level in the image as her bare calves are, mm. right? And they sort of, they, they, there's sort of two leaves that are sticking out just like there are two calves, right? They're sort of having this, this kind of relationship. Um, and that the texture of the pool cover combined with the, the, the line of the edge of the pool is very snake-like. Yeah, I mean, even as a pool, this is one of those kind of sinuous, right? It, it, it's not the um, rectangular plop down, you know, uh, very regular form pool. It's, it is that, uh, as I said, sinuous pool. I, I think part of the reason that those um, planty bits seem so like their fingers reaching out also has to do with the way the light is on them, that there are a few of them that seem to be illuminated. So we, we want to read them as hands and fingers. And of course the tile is a, yet another texture that we just see a little edge of here. Other thoughts about this photo? 
Yes, Ann Kendellen. Oh, Ann, you're still muted. Unmute yourself, please. Um, I'm glad someone else was seeing snakes in it because that occurred to me early on. But it also feels like it is teeming with, with whatever creatures. <laughs> It doesn't remind me. I mean, I, I thought pool right away, and yet it doesn't remind me of an actual pool. I think more of something filled with some kind of creature, some kind of life. I mean, it's weirdly like ripply. Uh, clearly, there is something that this figure can stand on, but also it's not lying flat as you would expect on the surface of water. I'm expecting um, poolside Amanda to chime in and explain it all to me. I think it's just like a fun backyard, like natural shaped pool instead of a lap pool. <laughs> You're killing my ceremonies and my rituals. But, and after uh, Molly's gonna go next, Molly Major. Okay, I'm sorry, then I'll just say something later after that. Um, I was thinking it was a pond, so very shallow pond with a cover over it. And I thought I had to turn off my monitor so I could get up really close. It looked to me like it was mosaic, like a mosaic cover, mm -hmm. but that she wasn't like walking on water. She was, you know, because it was a very shallow pond. Was there somebody else who was waiting to go next? I just wanted to ask everyone, what do you think the fence does though? Because if it was open, if it was like open, you know, it would be a totally different picture. There's this fence and it seems like there's like, it, it that tells something totally different. So is that, does anybody have any opinions about that? Um, Geraldine and then Chris are next. I'm just gonna go literal because I grew up with a pool as well. That's a solar cover on top of the pool and that's a lanai surrounding the pool so that they don't get bugs in it. Um, that's just my total literal and that's a monstrata plant over there that's leaning out. <laughs> so I'm just gonna stop being literal. Thank heavens you're here. Um, well, I'm, I know, I know exactly what these things are. I actually thought to initially looking at the photo that someone was underneath the solar cover lifting her up because we used to swim underneath the solar cover all the time at night when we weren't supposed to be in the pool. <laughs> so it's like things you learn. <laughs> I'm like, who's under who's holding her up underneath there? I mean, there's obviously, I think feel like there's a ladder or something that she's standing on. You can see a circle, but it's yeah that's all the literal things that I'm like no 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 this is what that is <laughs> yeah and for me I mean I wasn't reading it as lanai but having grown up in the northeast where the fanciest of fancy people had indoor pools that, yeah, that I mean, it could right it, that could just be Asian, you know and well it's probably in Florida or somewhere south they have them surrounding their whole backyards just because of the bugs and animals but, yeah was somebody else waiting Amanda Chris. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, so you're you're saying that's not a fence, that's glass. No. It, I don't know. Sorry. We don't we don't know. It's sorry. It's netting. It's like um it's fence material. So it's like window screens basically, all the way around it and over the top okay. as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I was seeing it as like a glassed in, you know, sort of um like a glassed in porch or something, a glassed in pool area. So that it was, so that it was uh, not really outdoors. It was sort of a creating an indoors, but yeah. Yeah, I was thinking it uh, does look like uh, a sunroom, but how unusual for the sun to be in the room rather than outside the room. <laughs> when you say the sun, you mean the, the light that we're seeing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it looks like a sunroom at night, but there's somebody that has a flash that can make the sun appear in the sunroom from the inside rather than the outside. So let me ask you all this. How, um, how would this feel different if the figure were facing us instead of sideways to us? It 
feel like I just had my picture taken. <laughs> Other thoughts, anybody? Chuck, are you ready to, is your hand still up from last time? Chuck's next. Sorry, my hand was still up from last time. I never lowered it. Also, you have that weird fake hand behind you that I find so disturbing. Oh. <laughs> your hand's always up. Do we have other thoughts on this or should we go on? Let's go on. Oh, okay. Anne, okay. Anne Candellan might want to have one final thought. You have to unmute again, Anne. The space bar is what I. I know. I just keep forgetting because I don't always mute. But um, I think if the figure was facing us, it would make the figure more um, carry more weight, so that some of the way we've been investigating everything around the figure would be somewhat lessened. It does feel like it would be a, a more familiar or common relationship right. to have the subject that way. Yeah. And it, it adds a different, it, it layers on yet more weirdness and intrigue about this very weird and intriguing image for me. I do not mean weird at all as a pejorative. I want to make that clear. <laughs> all right. Um, we have a poem next. Take a moment, think about the title of this poem. What are you expecting? What kind of portrait does a title, a strange, beautiful woman imply? And this time I'll give you the whole poem at once, although again, it's not a very long one. A strange, beautiful woman met me in the mirror the other night. Hey, I said, what are you doing here? She asked me the same thing. Was that the poem you were expecting from that title? Chris Rauschenberg, start us off. Well, I was expecting it to be uh, um, somebody talking about a strange, beautiful woman, rather than what it what it simultaneously is and isn't. <laughs> right. I mean, it is somebody talking about a strange, beautiful woman. She just happens the persona of the poem to also be talking about herself. Right. We presume. Yeah, I was expecting it to be uh, um, uh, uh, the subject and the uh, and the protagonist to be two different people. Yes, yes, a little more objectification, maybe. Chuck Barnes, are you going to jump in? I was basically about to say the same thing that the object we think it's going to be the there's the, the strange beautiful woman is the object, but she is the subject and the object simultaneously, which I think is the same thing. Other thoughts about this poem or how this poem speaks to or contrasts with either of the photographs that we looked at thus far? Molly Newgard and then Chris Rauschenberg and then you young. Well, I, I love that it's not a, a description because it does allow us to kind of conjure up in our own mind what strange and beautiful means. Um, and so it, 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 it is a poem that I think um, instead of giving us everything, oftentimes like a photograph, it allows us to go in yet other directions and wonder what how we would describe strange or beautiful as she, as, as she sees it or herself in the mirror, so. Yeah, and the relationship between those two terms, strange mm -hmm. and beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
Chris is up next. Yeah, and I think, I mean, for me, it's about this sort of moment of somebody realizing, is suddenly giving themselves credit for being beautiful when they, they don't, they didn't recognize that in themselves before. So it's this moment of revelation. It's that, uh, that godlike flash going off, <laughs> illuminating her to herself. Yes. Is Yu Yang next? Um, are we thinking about the, um, the, 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 some of the last, um, last three lines, like what are you doing here? And she asked me the same thing. I'm just like draw back to the double flash in the last photo. This like the, the, the reputation that the, that the same thing happened twice, both in, both in the photo and in it's in, and in this poem. Uh, and, uh, other than that, I'm also, um, I'm also really, uh, um, intrigued, but intrigued by this poem. Actually, this last three lines actually allows me, kind of allows me to um, to 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 imagine the tone, the the, the tone of of how they, how how the how 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 the person said that. Like I can almost imagine that conversation. Like, what are you doing here? And then that strange, beautiful woman my um my uh, react what are you uh, what are you doing here it's like this there's just there's just like so many ways to play with the tone of saying that sentence uh, saying saying that sentence out based on uh, based on the imaginative imaginative uh relationship between the writer and the this uh, strange beautiful woman yeah yeah and even but the, if we look at these as sentences, right? The first sentence, the subject of the sentence is the strange, beautiful woman. Subject of the sentence, second, second sentence is I, the speaker of the poem. The subject of the third sentence is the strange, beautiful woman again, right? So that moving back and forth. And of course, Yu Yang was the one who was arguing for maybe uh, there being glass that was bouncing flashback in the last photograph that we saw, but that here there's, we know there's a reflection, right? When some, the, the person we're meeting in the mirror is definitely a reflection, but that last line inverts that, right? What are you doing here? I said to my reflection, but then my reflection asked me the same thing, which makes me wonder, Am I the thing or am I the reflection of the thing? Because my presence is as surprising on my side of the mirror as the strange, beautiful woman I'm seeing in the mirror. Molly Major, what do you think? Why? I think if if she's saying what are you doing here and she's saying it out loud her image is also saying the same thing yes. at the same time so i thought of it as clever yeah. um like a not a joke but like a like she was winking at herself and also this very clear inversion of um Who's, our, who's the most famous female figure in front of a mirror? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all, right? Whereas that is somebody who's arrogant in their assumption of their beauty and parenthetically evil uh, versus somebody who is surprised to find this beautiful woman. So surprising that she's strange in how beautiful she is in the mirror. Chuck Barnes, what do you think? I'd say that it's interesting that if with the mirror, the that the speaker in the poem is undergoing two kinds of reflection, you know, the optical reflection and a sort of internal reflection at the at the same time. Okay. Playing on the fact that we use those words literally and metaphorically. Do we have time to sneak in one more photograph? 
Yes. Is that is that Molly Newgard is is nodding in her uh, authoritarian? Okay. Here we go. <laughs> um, so this is Jasmine Clark again, the same person who did the uh, the, the one-eyed figure in between the shutters or the doors. And my first question for you is, was this legal for me to call this a portrait? Is this a portrait? Uh, our resident art historian, Molly Newgard would like to go first. And <laughs> Geraldine and then Chris Rechenberg after that. Great. And uh, before we start on this, I should also mention that Geraldine did very kindly put in the chat um, some links to the ongoing discussions about the use of the terminology slave and master. And so folks might, uh, before you end up peeling off, want to copy some of those links and take a look at them. Um, or maybe even Amanda will copy them and send them to us. But anyway, uh, mm -hmm. resident his art historian Molly Newgard, please. Well, I, I think it would say how we have to ask the question first, how do we define a portrait? Um, and are there parameters to defining a portrait? Could a portrait be a, you know, a silhouette? Do we have to have the details? Do we have to, do we have to meet the eye of the viewer? Do we have to actually be able to describe them in great detail? And we can to some degree, um, but yeah, I would say this is an, this is an aspect of portraiture. I think aspect of portraiture is a pretty good description, but I, as a photographer, feel like anytime there's a person, there is a portrait, because it, but it's also like everything is a portrait in photography to me because it's <laughs> sense of space, and, you know, so it, I sort of get, I pummel a little bit through that, but I think, I think how she said that it, you know, it's, I think that was pretty key. Well, to me, what and I see this as a double portrait, but what what makes it a portrait is that it's not just a person in the picture, like you could have a person in an architectural photograph to show scale of the building, but it's it's a the the purpose of the picture is to show you the individuality of the person in the picture. That it's about who is this person, not just that. Oh, yeah, there's a person there. Um, so for me, I think this picture is very much about who who these people are and what's their relationship and how do they feel and all that. So I would say it's a double portrait. So let's build on that and ask the question of how does the way this portrait, certainly the way this photograph is composed, what's the effect of the, of the way it's composed? What what is the what is the work that all the elements of this photograph are doing? Molly Major's hand is was that from last time? I'm wondering if that it applies still. You want to chime in, Molly? Um, well, because it's sort of a silhouette like Kara Walker's work, um, it, to me it means it's sort of emblematic of of perhaps uh, um, there are clues into the, the diaspora that, they, that these people stem from um, through the hair um, mostly, I guess, and the skin tone, um, even though it's dark, you can tell that it's a darker skin tone. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say actually. Other observations or questions about? Chris Rauschenberg, go ahead. Yeah, well, if we can leap back uh, several sessions to, to Chun Li. <laughs> I mean, to me, I think the way this picture is constructed, it's like, it's this, it's this picture of a loving relationship with a father and presumably daughter. Um, and that this is something that's not seen. And that it's it's photographing something that's that's in the dark, <laughs> uh, culturally, and uh, and so for me it has that resonance of not just sort of saying who are these people and and how do they care about each other, but it's like 
and how does the larger society recognize or fail to recognize that? And there's so much, I mean, I feel like there's a real intimacy in this photograph, not just the closeness, the physical intimacy between these two figures. The, um, I like Chris, I'm reading it as a father holding a daughter, but definitely a loving adult uh, holding a child about whom they care deeply. But also there's a little bit of an intimacy about us peering in on this, right? That we are within what seems pretty clearly to be a domestic space and we are there with them. Um, and that our presence, the, that whatever connection is happening between them is, is not disrupted by our presence. So we're sharing in the intimacy that, that they are sharing. And I also wonder whether I would look at this photograph differently if I had not lived through 2020, because that sense of the interior being in shadow and the exterior being so light um, and what it means to be, to hold somebody close or be held close inside when there's a whole bright world out there. I mean, the curtains aren't even open. We, they're not even looking at that bright world. Um, would I, I feel like I, like I feel differently about this photograph because of the amount of time that I have spent inside and apart from everybody except the one person I live with in this year. And I don't, I don't know if I would ever be able to see this photograph in quite this way if I hadn't lived through 2020. What do you guys think about the relationship between interior and exterior here? Chuck Barnes and then Ann Candelan after that. I think you definitely, you know, we have, we, we can, we know that there is an outside. There's this little crack in the curtains, right? So you know that there's an outside, but um, they're just behind, yeah, behind the, the guy's head and kind of above his, his head. But really this is like, it's, it's its own, that world, we just know that, that it exists, but we know nothing about the, that world outside. This is entirely the, the interior world of the relationship Sorry. as well as the, as well as the uh, domestic space. And Candelan, would you like to go? Yeah, ahead? I think there's also um, just a beautiful complexity to the, sh to, the, to the lines, the outline of these two figures and then the outlines uh, evident in the stitching on the, the curtain and the sheerness of it and just the play of light and dark throughout it. And the sh there's a sheerness to the curtains and a solidity, especially to the, um, the man's figure, right? I'm, I can't 100% tell, but I think he's not wearing a shirt so that what we're really seeing is, or the lines of his body, not the lines of clothing, right? So he is again, and there was one picture in particular that I talked about when we were looking at some leads work together a few months ago of um, the strength of him, the solidity of him holding her that I think, as you were saying, Anne, against the sheerness of the curtains. Um, you, can, you can feel how thin those curtains are in your hands um, and how different that is from what he represents as a figure in, in her world and in this world. Um, and Eugenia has said, right, that we also read those curtains as somehow uh, around a kind of femininity, right? That, that which is a completely cultured, gendered bullshit, but yet we do read it that way. Um, but that uh, that also seems to contrast with this um, with his figure in some interesting ways. Uh, Chris Rauschenberg, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, flashing back to what Molly was saying about you know, as a as a woman, when you go outside, you have to be hyper vigilant <laughs> um, because you're under threat. Um, I mean, to me, 
uh, this is not something that I thought of just looking at the picture, but in response to Lois's question, it's like, yes, I can, I can be strong and protective and loving and, and we're safe here inside and out there. I mean, why, why would you want to open those curtains out there is a place where you go and, and you could be killed any minute for nothing. You know, I mean, there's the, I mean, to look at it in, in, in our um, not just year of COVID, but our year of recognizing the, the threat to life and limb that particularly black men have when they when they walk out on the sidewalk. I, I can't help but answer. And, that. Yeah. And also that black children face as well. And that sense of there's something that I wrote not long after George Floyd was murdered. And I was talking about the, what it means to hold, I was in that case talking about an infant, but to hold a child and know that you cannot protect them against the harm that your country and your society might do them, will do them on some level. So, um, so both his vulnerability, but also his vulnerability, if we are presuming that this is a photograph located in the US or in some other racist place, uh, but also her vulnerability in that same way. I know it's getting late. Does anybody want to get out any final thoughts on this one? Zemi, our, our dear Zemi would like to maybe finish this up. I was just gonna add on to Chris's comment, um, especially with this idea of interior and exterior and with the other photographs and this idea of seeing, um, it seems like, especially being in silhouette is an added protection or a barrier um, in the sense of like privacy and also perhaps not like seeing all of uh, the individuals in this portrait, it's not for us perhaps to mm. see all of it. Um, we're not allowed that access. And I think it's similar with how the gaze is functioning in the other two images. Um, either it's very direct and perhaps confrontational or completely you know, uh, pushing back with the flash, but in this case with the shadow. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask you to indulge me before we finish everybody, because I, I don't think we have time to talk about another poem, but I wanna read the next poem that I had um, in part because Chuck very kindly for my birthday gave me this wonderful new book of poetry. Uh, there's a new anthology of African American poetry that's just come out. Kevin Young, who I went to college with, so the fact that he's incredibly talented and prolific kind of always makes me seethe with envy. Um, Kevin Young edited it and it's fantastic. I own many anthologies of poetry and many anthologies of African American poetry and none is like this. So if you are looking for a, a gift, a late belated Hanukkah or Christmas or Kwanzaa, or just because you like somebody gift for somebody, this is an excellent book. Um, and I found this poem in it, and I have to say, I didn't even know this poet. Um, Anita Scott Coleman was born in Mexico to an African-American father, and, and a, a, I'm not sure what her mother's background was, and then grew up, her family moved to New Mexico. So she is a a figure who is at the time of the Harlem Renaissance, but actually in the Southwest. And this poem was just seemed to me the perfect pairing to the last photograph. And it's called Portraiture, which makes me feel vindicated for my wanting to call things portraits tonight. Portraiture. Black men are the tall trees that remain standing in a forest after a fire. Flames strip their branches. Flames sear their limbs. Flames scorch their trunks. Yet stand these trees, for their roots are thrust deep in the heart of the earth. Black men are the tall trees that remain standing in a forest after a fire. So I just kind of don't, that one just blows me away and I wanted it to leave you blown away at the end of a, a fantastic evening of discussion. So thank you all. Uh, for coming again on this journey from Lois's head into your great thoughts. Um, and uh, do we have any blue sky, any official, anything that we wanna to say to folks about upcoming programs or anything before people log off? Sure. <laughs> we do have um, 
actually a panel discussion with the artist, uh, two of the artists that we talked about tonight, as well as, um, let's see, Nadia Nakorda, and then the curator, Erin Turner. So that would be Jan Wednesday, January 6th at 5 p.m. So it's on our website and you can register that way. It's another, it's more of a webinar setup, but it's, I think it'll be a really great discussion. And um, if you feel lonely because you weren't able to get to the discussion that we had of Glenna's work, I think that the recording of that session is now on up through the Blue Sky site, yes, yes. Um, and I have a secret hope that we will get to have another one of these discussions uh, in January with some of the other maybe non-portraits that are in um, the uh, Women of the African Diaspora exhibition. Although seeing Geraldine here, I'm like, yeah, we didn't get to do Geraldine's work either. At some point, we'll come back because I love your photographs. Oh, there's always so much to talk about. Thank you all for um, for bringing a little light into the very dark days of December in Portland in 2020. You're not, yeah, at least you're Portland. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so yeah. much. Bye-bye. Holiday, everyone. Holiday. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.